we're going to talk about uh, cryoablation and uh, where it fits in the treatment of prostate cancer. I had the good fortune uh, to meet a gentleman by the name of uh, Jeffrey Cohen, who's at Allegheny General Hospital, and he and Gary Honig were one of the pioneers in putting cryoablation on the map. This is one of the cryo machines. <clears throat> the application can be either in a global sense, where if we're dealing with a particular diseased organ, we can destroy the entire organ. It can be a subtotal event, meaning that we choose to uh, apply this technology to only a portion of that system, organ system. Or, as you'll learn this evening, it can be a focal event, which means if we have reason to believe that we know where a primary problem is within the prostate, uh, we can eliminate that primary problem. Well, first let's talk a little bit about how it works. The Jewell-Thompson effect is the key. I'll explain that. This is a reservoir of high-pressure gas, as is this. This is argon, this is helium. These are valves that meter the flow of these gases, and generally speaking, it's one gas at a time that's flowing. Uh, there's a very small opening here, or a venturi, and as this high-pressure argon flows through this system and expands as it goes through that venturi, uh, very cold temperatures are generated at the tip of the cryoprobe, uh, as low as minus 200 degrees centigrade. The other side of this is helium, and interestingly, if we run helium through this system, as helium expands going through the venturi, it heats, and it will uh, generate temperatures uh, as high as 70 degrees centigrade. So we literally can control the freeze that is being used on any particular target. This is a template. This correlates with a picture on an ultrasound system. And we know what areas of the prostate are being affected or what areas are being targeted. And we can watch what happens in those areas. This is a, a more comprehensive view. And here we have the ultrasound probe in the rectum, the cryoprobes in the prostate, and we actually have a urethral warmer here protecting the channel through which the urine flows. Now this is an ultrasonographic picture of the freeze. And this we would call the ice ball. This is the boundary of the freeze and this white line is essentially zero uh, degrees centigrade. Uh, below this are varying levels of cool temperature but not a lethal temperature. And this is from an ultrasound probe that's in the rectum. And clearly we don't want to freeze into the rectum because that could create uh, a number of different problems that we don't want to deal with. This is uh, an ultrasound system where we have Doppler so we can actually see the blood flowing in these tissues. Now just a little bit inside this line is minus 40 degrees centigrade. At minus 40 degrees centigrade, all life stops. Here is an overview of the uh, temperature ranges. Uh, when we get to minus 15 degrees centigrade, we start to uh, obtain uh, freezing within the cell matrix, and we start to disrupt things. A tomato, for instance, has a skin that's an osmotic membrane, and there's various things you can do to a tomato, but if you put it in a a heavy solution of salt water will literally shrivel up. And if you put it in very uh, sterile water without minerals, without salt in it, it will explode. Well, these are the kind of shifts that freezing creates. Uh, we all have heard about how immunology can be used in uh, oncology or the science of, of managing a malignant disease. 
Cryoablation may not just kill the primary tumor, it may set up an immune response that will go after the metastatic disease that some people have if you don't diagnose the disease early. We did a study, so we accumulated uh, between 2001 and 2005, 82 gentlemen who we treated as primary as opposed to almost salvage cases. After we treated them, we did PSA at three month intervals for two years, and then we would move uh, to a six month interval, and to this day, that's still the case. We would biopsy these gentlemen at six, 12, and 18 months. The biochemical failure was based on PSA, we all know that number, prostatic specific antigen, and anything above a half a nanogram per deciliter was considered, anything above that was considered evidence that, that there was something going on. And we also um, biopsied these patients, and if we had positive biopsies, we would retreat them. We found some patients who had residual prostate on, disease on biopsy, and they had perfectly normal PSAs. We went back and treated those folks, and they did very well. And what we found was that patients of that type who failed early would have small volume disease and it was easy to deal with. So the median age of our patients was 72. Uh, the median PSA was six. And the median follow-up the time we last did this collation of data was 51 months. Undetectable PSA and three negative biopsies, 66% uh, of the patients at 51 months demonstrated this. Undetectable PSA, 76, and negative biopsy, uh, 79. We have 82 patients. Uh, they had a catheter for eight days. They had mild discomfort when they urinated, and none of these patients, zero, had any problem with urinary control. Now, I wish we <coughs> could say the same thing about erectile dysfunction, but remember, we're talking about global cryoablation. Now, another 23% of the patient had erectile dysfunction, but they had it before the treatment, and it was a given that we were starting there. And 28% um, had uh, post-operative erections, some of them with the medications that we're all familiar with, um, Cialis, Viagra, Levitra. We have a high percentage of erectile dysfunction with the global approach to cryoablation. 91% uh, of our patients were done as outpatients. Uh, from the time we started the procedure till the time they were home in their own house was less than eight hours. And uh, most of those patients drove to the follow appointment, which was 48 hours later. And the conclusion, simply put, is third generation cryo is a very appropriate treatment for carefully selected patients who have prostate cancer.